it's a long story. It all started as I became a nurse at the Derbyshire Royal Infirmary. I trained there in 1954 to 1957 and during my time there I used to visit a very good friend who lived on the outskirts of Hatton and one evening when I was staying at the farm there was a local dance that night and my husband-to-be was there and we met and we danced and we walked home together and from that love blossomed you could say. In 1957, we married and I'd come to live in Hatton when I'd finished my nursing training. Me and my husband bought a bungalow in Hatton and I decided I'd get a little job. And I went down and got a job at the Glassworks. On the same road was where I lived, Scropton Lane. When I was 14, one Saturday evening, I was sitting with the family inside the house watching TV and Dad came in from the, uh, from the, the pubs in Tutbury, which he used to do his rounds. And he said, to me, he said to me, Bev, what do you want to be when you leave school? Do you want to be a fitter at Trent Valley Glassworks, a welder at Clayton's or electrician at Clayton's? As soon as he said electrician, I said, I want to be an electrician at Clayton's. He said, right, you've got the job. I never had to go for an interview. And the reason that was because Dad used to drink with George Wilson, who was a workshop manager. And if he said he got the job, he got the job. I started at Clayton's in December 1961. My brother-in-law, who worked at Clayton's at the time, got me an interview there. I went down one Saturday morning, and then he said, what's the area of a circle? And I told him the answer, and he said, you can start. Looking on the hindsight, side, it was one of the best things I ever did in my life. If we got a job, we, we just went to it. I, was, we'd, I mean, those days, we, I mean, ambition, I hadn't got a clue uh, what we wanted. The majority of us hadn't. I always wanted to be a nurse, so that was the path I took. I did training at Stafford before coming to Derby, and... My uh, ambition really was to look after people. Someone came to me and said, what, what are you doing down on the farm? And it was just general work like. And uh, I said, you want to try and get at the factory, you get more money there. <laughs> I was uh, on the milk dock stacking milk churns to start with and then uh, gradually over the years I moved through the factory and uh, did more or less every department there was. <laughs> it was a good move really. I did 40 years there. Oh I went to Nestles for a, a 12 months. I went there when I was 15. Threatens farther in an hour, I was getting, if you can remember the old money. But I, I left after, and I went to the glassworks, then I did. I was blowing bottles for Harry Shaw. I did a few years there, then I went to Hill Creek making concrete blocks. God, it was graph, that was. And then from there, I went to Nestles. Yeah. And I stayed there till I retired, 34 years. In 1961, my father started work at Trent Valley and decided that once it was permanent employment, that he'd move all the family, that's five boys and my mum and, and the cat, to a two-bedroom terraced house no more than 50 yards away from the factory. It was based uh, in Scropton Lane in Hatton. There had actually been a glassworks on that site since the 1800s. It made Pond's hand cream glass, it manufactured Chanel glass. It manufactured the big glass tiles that offices use as walls, which most folks in the village used as doorstops or ashtrays. Big stuff, little stuff, anything that it could produce for semi-automatic production. It started off just with ordinary, what they call white flint glass. That's ordinary glass, you know. And uh, again, then developed on with blue glass for the liners. 
then we made uh, brown glass, uh, at, well amber glass, uh, for the um, uh, uh, poison bottles, things like that, you know, with the ribs down the side. We also made opal, white opal, and uh, we also made ruby glass. The main changes was when I started there, it was milk uh, coming in from the farms. And uh, that finished and they changed over to coffee. In 1974, the town started working at their source. It was funny getting an overall given you and a, a cap to put on and heavy shoes with these uh, steel caps. And it was all ladies where I worked. I started down in Nesquik. It's a milk drink. There was a sealer that you put your seal bit on the, on the end. You've got your fingers cut a little bit on that. And then from there we went up to Transwrap, uh, where they made little sachets. We just sat on the machine packing those. Then we had to start to learn everything on the ground floor where the coffee was made. So we had to learn how to go round the line. So we went from the depalletizer onto the lights and watched the jars go by. We had to fill the capper. And then we went into the filling room to do the weighing and putting the caps on where the seals went on the caps. Then we'd go back on the end and we used to stack all day long by hand. And sometimes it was a bit hard if you was on the big jars and lots of laughs in them days. Easy work for good money. I went on, started on shift work like everybody did. Three shifts, six to two, two ten and ten six, six till twelve and twelve till six on Saturday. And then Sunday was voluntary overtime. Well, they're a great crowd, actually. I hadn't really any ambition just to get a job. And when I came to leaving school, Clayton's were looking for apprentices. I went for the interview one day, got the job the next. So I started there, went into the machine shop, apprentice fit a machinist. In the first week, they said to me, that's your bench. And I had my own bench. And they said, right, See all those broken uh, grinding machines and, and uh, drills and everything there. We want you to fix them. Well, of course, I haven't got a clue. It's my first week at work. I've just left school. And I actually learnt within a year I could, you know, rebuild or remake any of the machines they had. The job came up for an occupational health nurse at Nestle part-time. So I thought, with living in Hatton and it not being too far from home, I felt that that would be quite a good idea. And this was a new innovation for Nestle, and the purpose was to look after the workers and to make sure they were fit for purpose, as one might say, fit to do the job. You put your at ease within weeks of starting yeah. it, didn't it? Yes, definitely. There was yeah. no, nobody trying to send you on stupid errands for a left-handed spanner or yeah. anything well, like that. I don't know, I've had one or two. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Go for a, a glass hook or a glass <laughs> sky hook. And... When I first started and I did the machine rewiring and rebuilds, they also said, right, we want you to just come and help out on the locos. And at that time, they were building these special sugar locomotives for Cuba. As we walked by every time as kids, we did not realise what was going on in Clayton's. And then when you went through the doors and you saw these locomotives being built there, you just thought, this, is this happening in our village? We didn't know anything about it. The family business was slaughtering when I was a little lad, although it, it tended, the slaughtering was done at a weekend, and in the week there were retail butchers. When I left school, I went into building surveying. It stood me in good stead because um, when I did come into the family business in 1980, uh, the premises needed updating a bit and um, it, so it came in useful for that. And then again in the mid-90s I built a, a new abattoir. My dad was a, a production operator. In those days, he would either blow, be a blower, glass blower, which was the final process of making the, the jar, or he would what was called a taker in, which they had to transport the finished glass to a leer to be annealed, or he worked regular nights on the leer, which was taking the 
cooled glass off the conveyor belt and putting it into boxes. I worked in the stopper shop. Well, you had to have a train. I'd never seen anything like it before. I mean, I'd never done, I'd never worked with glass at all. Um, and you had to be shown how to do it and how to work the wheel. I really enjoyed it when I got to learn how to do it. We used a, on a grinding machine. We had to wear um, a towel round us so we didn't get wet. We were in water all the time. It was a machine where you held these stoppers onto a, a roller that grinded the glass and made it smooth. And then they went to the lady that was polishing. When you started the job, you had to turn the tap on and you sat at it like a trough. I don't know what, why, but we always had water. You know, when you grind in the stoppers, you had to get them really straight on the top. Polished rockers. In them days, you weren't allowed to do any of the skilled work until you'd, you'd done a lot of the painting and stuff like that, you know, not, not really skilled work. But I think I was about 18 when I started to wind my first armature. If you know motors at all, you've got a piece, a centrepiece that spins, and they are called armatures. Basically, what I enjoyed, uh, once I'd learnt all the things, I got to, I got to work abroad and down the pits, go and commission locos and uh, mend them or commission them. Abroad I've been to places I would never dreamt to go into if I hadn't had that job. By the time I finished my apprenticeship, I was married and I got a young son and things were hard. It was very tight we lived with my mum for a while, but I started to do well at night school and the company picked up on that and they offered me a transfer into the offices. Well, in in 1960, 61, 62, that was a big deal. When I went home and told my mother, she was cock a hoop about it. When you went into the offices in those days, it was it was something. There was these massive locos, and you know, as I mean, I was a young lad. I'm tall now, but I was short then, and so they were massive to me. So when you tried to climb up into the cab, <laughs> you're hanging on to the to the um, the ladder to go inside there. We were inside the control cab, but there'd be people in there welding, people in there grinding, and in those days they weren't so much about having safety um, goggles or anything. You just had to turn your head away, and sometimes you'd be well, you know, you'd be working away on the ground, and you, in the side of the head you get all these sparks from the grinder itching you on the side, but burning, you're just pitting your skin there. So you'd say, oh, oh, and they say, oh yeah, okay, and, but. There were all the different noises and there were people outside with sledgehammers. The next minute, boom! And you just think, whoa. I went into the fact with rather a lot of trepidation, not having been in the factory before, which was, to me, was very noisy. And all these people, tins clanking and this sort of thing. I thought, oh, I'll never stay here with all this noise. The conditions were quite good actually, but um, you had smelly jobs to do. You know, I mean, like you went into the seasoning room uh, for where they used to put the tins of cream to season out on the trays, and that was a smelly job. It was like sour milk. First, when you go there, you just go what they call taking in. There's four, four people work on the machine. There's a gatherer, the parison maker, and the blower, and the taker in. And the taker in just, uh, it just takes the, whatever you make in bottles or whatever it is from, from the machine to the, to the leer, which is a kneeling leer, which anneals the glass. And then, of course, you get blowing, you just have a go at blowing, and then you have a go at gathering all Paris and making out, I went on the Paris and... The amount of skill that went into it was unbelievable because the gatherer, uh, before he started his shift, in his own time, he had to get his rod, steel, steel rod, tapered steel rod, and make a, a clay ball at the end that was called a moil. And he used to have to make that himself before he started and bake it in the opening to the, um, to the, to the furnace, to the pot. 
And that was determined the size of glass that he was going to have to pick up because he, he repetitively put the, the moil on the surface of the glass and just picked up the right amount of glass and transferred it over to a parison, which was gravity fed. Then the parison maker with a pair of shears cut that glass called a gob, which had to be the right size every time because if it wasn't the right size, the mold was made for that size. Else you'd end up with faults. You'd end up with thick walls or thick base. And if it was too little, you'd end up with thin walls or it didn't form the glass. So it was, even though it was a manual, semi-skilled job, there was a lot of skill in those particular two men, the gatherer and the parison maker. The blower just added the extra, the extra air to it to push the glass out to fill the mould. But it all had to be done repetitively while, the, while the, the blower was finishing that last bit, the gatherer was getting another piece of glass to put in the parison and everything had to work. And then the taker in, he was, he was the checker as well. So he had to check every piece of glass to make sure that it was okay to carry on onto the lear to be annealed. It wasn't a job that just anybody could do. Gathering and parison maker, they didn't get them sort of job straight away. You, you had to start taking in, you know, before they'd even consider moving you up to one of them jobs. Because they were the two chaps that made that chair make money. And in turn made the factory make money. It was piecework, you see. So if you wanted to earn money and you were on a good chair, it was a chair which was a group of men that, that did the production, from the gatherer, the parison maker, the blower, and the taker in. And if you got a good gang or chair, you could, you could earn good money. In those days, it was uh, quite a good place to work on piecework. It was one of the best paid around here. The harder you work, the more you got. It, to say it was arduous work, and it was hot, of course. It was incredible, really. Because, uh, I mean, when you're standing in front of a hole in the furnace, and in there, it's 1,300 degrees centigrade. It's hot. We got fans blowing all around the place, but all they did was blowing hot air all around. But uh, it was a very good crowd. I enjoyed working for Trent Valley. We were all a nice, lovely crowd of people. I started as soon as I'd finished school, and I was a coil winder. There was, I think, five or six of us. We wound coils, which was on a machine. Different sizes for the motors. Some had got 10,000 winds on, some had got 15. You sat at a machine, which was about so wide, and it had got a winder on. You got a foot pedal, like you have on a sewing machine, and you placed, like, tough cardboard, really, oblongs on, and you clamp them together, and then you put your wire through the hole, and you had to wind, and you watch, you had to guide it so that they were perfectly flat, and then you had to put a layer of silicone paper in between, and then you do your next layer. You just did winding until you, you got the counter to the right amount, and you cut it off, put the end of the wire through the cardboard and just place it to one side and then start your next one. Once it left me, it went to three of the other women who varnished them and then they were put on one side and they had to be go in the oven for about oh, 48 hours until they were rock hard and then they'd come out and then they would go to Graham. He was a motor builder, so they would have these coils and put them into the motors. We weren't on piecework. You could stand up, have a chat or whatever. It wasn't like monotonous. You could do it to your own speed sort of thing. Nobody was ever sort of, oh, you've got to do 50 of those a today. I started working for the buyer, time with him into estimating, did quality control into the drawing office, went through all aspects of it, and, and I sort of got more and more noticed until I went into the sales department, then I became sales manager, sales director, and eventually managing director. It, it was probably, with Nestles, it was the biggest employer in the area. Virtually everybody in Hatton either worked for Nestle or for Clayton. And the working conditions generally were good, but they were noisy, so that was something that had to be addressed to prevent people becoming deaf. So the ear defenders were then introduced. But occupational health, or first aid as people used to look on it as, 
involved all the aspects of keeping people healthy within a working environment. I was in Transrap and there was like a room, a glass sort of box room, and the women used to sit at the machines, collect 20 of the packs of sachets, put them into a box, put the lid down, put them on a little conveyor belt, and it used to come out. Well, this day I was standing there and you could see your own reflection in the Perspex glass cupboard that the people were inside. You could see your own reflection and I saw somebody coming up behind me and I thought it was one of the foremen, Gerald Smith, because he was a devil. But if you was doing something, he'd come and poke you in the ribs like that and make you jump out. You couldn't cope with it at all. And I could see this person coming up behind me. I couldn't see the face, but I could see the shape of him and I could see my own reflection and I thought, before he does it, I'm going to turn round and scare him. So I turned round and there was nobody there. And yet I could see this reflection behind me as, as clear as you are. And it frightened me to death. I, I stopped packing and I went into the room and I told the women and that was it. We shut everything down, we did. Nobody would go to the toilet on their own or anything. It, it was really, really scary. In the 1980s we had to modernise the abattoir. You had to have a day at least of water supply in storage. Previously a slaughterman had to have a, a scabbard with maybe four or five knives in and he'd use one for one job and then he'd change and use another for the next job. Uh, whereas uh, the regulations as they tightened required that each knife should be sterilised between each operation. There was a point at which the uh, regulations outlawed wooden butcher's blocks so that had to be removed and a plastic one was on order and the wooden block was under the barn across the yard where the hay and straw were kept for bedding animals and the meat inspector one day he bought some meat for himself and he was in the barn cutting it up on the wooden block because the plastic block hadn't arrived yet and in fact since then, I believe wooden blocks are now no longer outlawed because they've found out that bacteria can't survive on wooden blocks where it can on plastic. A wooden block is more hygienic. My ambition during school, up to leaving, was to be a fine artist. And I got places at two art colleges. Uh, but I didn't go because my dad was out of work and you didn't get financial help then days like you do. And I ended up at the Trent Valley Glassworks and I went thinking, because you're 16, quite naive, oh, they're going to put me in the office. And I went to work in the acid etching shop. <laughs> I could see what everybody else was doing. So there were people with settling torches cutting massive three-inch pieces of steel, cutting through them in a perfectly straight line. And you saw from from the basis of a piece of metal being brought in, how it was cut, bent, shaped, welded, and it went out as a locomotive. Well, we were getting towards the end of the mainline locomotives. We built them for British Rail, two or three contracts, New Zealand Government Railways, Western Australian Railways, uh, Saba Railways, Jamaica Railways, we exported them to South Africa. We built the most powerful diesel and electric locomotives ever to leave these shores. The company made a decision, and this was where I really came in, in, in 59, 60, 61. Well, we needed to use our expertise, but we needed to, to branch out. And what we did, we went into mining locomotives and tunnelling locomotives. So I remember the first contract number, 4530, was for Merrill Island in Canada. So we built small locomotives from two tonnes up to 25 tonnes, operated on rails underground in either coal mines or metalliferous mines for hauling the ore trains from the face to the bottom of the pit shaft where they were hauled up to the top of the pit shaft. Now we built those and we supplied them to about 80 countries around the world. And I went to 65 of those countries selling them and we became the number one supplier in the world of mining locomotives. People talk about the glassworks, talk about, and all about the good times. 
it wasn't a, a good place to work for comfort or anything like that. It was basic. I mean, the women worked there. I mean, they worked really hard, but it was hard work. And uh, but it was a good crowd. I've had some good memories. Yeah, I've seen a lot of things I would never have seen if I hadn't worked there. Mm. Been a lot of places and met a lot of people. You, you meet different people in life, and there's some. Some characters, real characters that work there, mm. weren't there? Was, yeah. Look back on the, the how good the blokes were, really. I'd never been in a factory before. I'd never seen anything like it before. So to go in, the smell, the sweat of the people that were working there, even though it was early in the morning, and um, boy, was I nervous. I was treated with suspicion, rather, initially, because I thought, what, what is she going to do? You know, this sort of thing. They hadn't been used to this sort of thing. People used to have the big bouffant hairstyles with all the hair out and wear sandals for work and that sort of thing. However, as time went on, like everything else, they accepted me and I became part of the factory community. It was acid shot work, so you had you had a board, and I don't know if, even if they still do Charlie perfume, but that used to be the biggest one we did. Mm. You'd have 54 bottles in bungs on the board, and you had to lift them, dip them into a bath of acid, then dip them into a rinsing bath, and then you'd put them in a bath where you rinse them off, and hopefully they'd all come out this nice white Acid colour, but you hadn't had aprons, arm shields, goggles. If you've got acid in your eye, the four person on the job, they literally take you, put your eye under the hot, cold water tap. Oh, you're all right, get back to work. Well, I suppose the pay was the right for the time of uh, the time we were working, you know, the, the money. Uh, I can't remember what the wage was now. My first wage packet, I think it was £4.50. And I went home, and bearing in mind, I think I was coming up for, when I was 16, coming up for 17, and give it my mum. <laughs> and then my mum giving me two pounds out of it. Yeah, they had a shutdown. Yeah, they had a two week shutdown. Uh, I always remember, uh, fortunately, it was always around my birthday, the, uh, at the end of July. So we always used to go to Blackpool. Yeah, the factory just shut down. They had to keep the, the furnaces going and the boilers going because they, they couldn't let them cool down. But otherwise, yeah, they, 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 had the, uh, they had the glass work shut down. There was a social club and this was on site and the manager at that time had a wooden building erected for meetings for the social club and there were sports teams, ladies football teams, men's football teams and they used to play other factories. We well, had a Christmas party. At Christmas, then they give us. We had a party, yeah. Well, that's Clayton's. I thought we had a, an outing. I'm sure we did. So, I mean, you're yes, that's top the top. Trent Valley. Yeah. Trent Valley outing. That one. That's the one. You used to get a thimble of sherry if it was somebody's birthday. And then uh, you'd climb on top of the stacker boxes and you'd have to do a bit of a dance because that was our entertainment. And on a Friday, uh, the furnaces on the other side, where they used to do the sandblasting and everything, we used to take a potato wrapped in foil and the, the lads would bring it down for us. So on a Friday dinner, we had a jacket potato together, which health and safety standards, because you'd not washed your hands, you just sat there on what you were working on and sat on a jacket potato. On the night shift, there was one chap from uh, Yatox on the Lears doing the sorting and that, and he could sing, and there was quite a lot, and they, they were singing at night, and there was, there was a lady in the house that was opposite her, and I know all my life, when I go to work on morning, she said to me, she can I have a word, Harry? I said, yeah, she said, I said the singing is lovely, so it's just, it's really nice, it sounds like, but two o'clock in the morning, it's a little bit too much, she said. Well, I considered it as a good job because I was going home and putting a wage packet on the family's table. So that meant, as a large family, 
you knew that bread and butter would be put there at some point for you to eat as well. You know, and it's the feeling of achievement, I think, in them days was greater the fact that you were helping your family. Whereas these days, it's to buy the car, buy the house and everything. Back then, we were so grateful to help our families. I worked 35 years there, from 1960 in February to June 1995. So that was 35 years' service. To me, it was like a big family. And uh, the nice thing about it is that uh, Whenever you meet people, you talk about Trent Valley Glassworks. You know, people who work there, you talk about it. You know, about the old times, as they say. It's uh, it's incredible. It still still goes on. That does. Well, unfortunately, through lack of orders and uh, mass production, the factory came to a halt in and finally shut in July, uh, nineteen eighty three. There was a lot of imports coming in. That's what really killed it. And uh, of course we were semi-automatic, but automatic machines as well could make a hell of a lot more. They, they could um, make as many in a shift as we could make in a week. It was a terrible shame for the village because you just took it for granted that Tramp Valley was there. That was, that was the village employment. And for it to shut, and it, and it sat there idle for a long, long time and they didn't do anything with it. It was just a shell of a building that was slowly deteriorating. And then uh, it just they just flattened it all and then now they've built bungalows on it. The day came when we finished on the Friday and I stood at the bottom of the stairs. I thought, I'm not going to get upset about this. I, you know, I'm a grown man here. Got upstairs, got in his office and I just bawled my heart out. Just cried like a baby. My husband always said, when we came, he says, I'm sure the factory will fall down when you leave. And he took me out for dinner that night and we came back via the factory and his comment was, oh, the factory is still standing. <laughs> Which I thought was quite funny, really. But I did enjoy my time there, enjoyed working with people and seeing that they helped was not affected by their working conditions. I gave, gave up slaughtering uh, because uh, I'd, ex I'd built a new abattoir, the business had expanded enormously. Um, I was working 24-7 and no longer wanted it. It wasn't enjoying it anymore and subsequently let my abattoir, uh, and it is now actually a halal sheep abattoir. because you're able to mix. In the early days, nobody had very much and everybody was helpful. And there's still a certain amount of that now, but we all should retain memories and keep the friendship and love in the village going. Yes, I just love it. Everybody's friendly, everybody talks to you. There's everything here, shops, buses, everything. Everybody in Hatton knows about this one, the log vase. This is a smaller version, there's a bigger one of it. And it's, there's quite a few in the village. And uh, yeah, we, we used to make thousands of those. I love it here. Hatton is the reason I've not moved away. Hatton is the reason I've got involved with so many community groups to try and keep that community going. The youth group absolutely love that with a passion. And I just love being in Hatton. I'm a proud to be a Hatterian, <laughs> or whatever we're called. This one was made for the bicentenary at the Beaumore's Whiskey on Isla. They sent the original bottle, which they'd found on a tip, and asked if we could replicate it, which we did. I was quite proud of that one because uh, it's a very difficult one to make, that. Everybody who leaves Hatton, they always come back, so it's got to have something. It's got to have something that brings everybody back. I think it's just a friendly place, everybody knows everybody, and that's it. A lot of people uh, will, will say, yeah, I remember that, and then they get going on what happened, you know. You forget things, and 
get as old as me if you get a lot of things. But uh, you, you set people's thoughts going again, and they they remember. Mm -hmm.